I'd like to thank each and every one of you. The Miss Mob couldn't have grown this much in the span of two years without your endless support. I've gathered some people in the horror community. Enjoy the show. I was about 13 years old at the time the story took place. My parents and my brother moved out of the house for a bit to go on some vacation for a band tour they wanted to see. At the time I wasn't that interested, and I had a lot of schoolwork and stuff on I had to do. So my dumb mind decided I'd stay home and not go. Now you were probably thinking, why on earth would a 13 year old kid be staying home by himself like this? And yeah, I know, why would I be? But at the time my parents trusted me, and we did have a pair of good loyal neighbours that would check on me time and time off when I babysat the house. They'd also drop me in at school at the time, in the mornings, when I didn't have my family around. Which was cool of them to do. Anyways, onto this story. It was a Tuesday night, my family had been gone for a couple hours and they said they would be back home in the next two days. I was in my living room, watching some dumb cartoon show around 7.52pm at night. For some reason, I was feeling a bit tired at the time. Every time, once I sit on a couch or a comfortable area to relax in, I'd normally fall asleep. At this age, it wasn't that common for 13 year olds to feel always tired all the time, but it was for me. I was always tired after coming home, but anyways, it was probably due to the schoolwork and stuff I had to be doing late night hours. I finished watching the cartoon show on my TV and was best to get something to eat before going to bed. I got up from my couch and started heading into the kitchen, finding some leftover from the night before. It was spaghetti bowls, and boy, me being a 13 year old, it was the only thing I knew how to make at the time. Now as I was pulling out the bowl of spaghetti, I turned my back to take off the glad wrap of the bowl. There is a window in front of the sink behind me, that's when I look up and see the most terrifying, chilling thing, I see somebody standing in my backyard. I couldn't tell who it was but it looked like a 20 year old somewhat man dressed in all black. He was standing there. My eyes could just faintly see him, the outline of his hoodie, sweater, and the body build he had. I could feel my heart slowly pumping very fast, and I felt so creeped out. I turned off the kitchen light and sprinted to my room and locked the door. Me freaking out, I didn't know what to do. In situations like this, when I'm shocked, my brain doesn't think, and I go blankness. That's when I hear the front door of my house open up, then close. I screwed up, big time. By not locking all doors could have been the biggest mistake I had made as a kid, probably for my life. I didn't want to move in case they loaded the person that was literally in my house. I sat there on the floor of my room for maybe close to 15 minutes or something crazy like that. For me, it felt like hours, but it was the smartest thing to do because if I were to confront whoever this was, they could have easily taken me down. That's when I had the balls to get up and check if this peeping Tom was still around. So I creaked open the door and looked around the house quietly. The house was pitch black, except the living room light that I forgot to turn off. The guy looked like he had left my house. I exit my room and tiptoe around, making sure he was. That's when I go to our home phone and begin to dial the phone to the police. Then I realise, this dude had cut off our phone line, completely. I felt my heart just about come out of my chest. I stood there freaking the fuck out, sweat dripping down my forehead, thinking what I'd do if the dude is still in the house. That's when the most terrifying thing I ever experienced happened. I turn my back, and there is the guy, standing right behind the wall, peeking his head. I scream so loud and get the hell out of the house to my neighbor's door. I yell out to them to come and answer the door, and they finally did and took me inside and cared for me. They dialed the police at this time, and they arrived at my house not much later. They said they didn't find anything of a break-in on the guy, although they did find of what sort of a sharp metal object that was left in the house of the room. In fact, they said it was left in my brother's room, this sharp object, and my brother's room wasn't far away from my own. Now, to that day, I have been so lucky that I got out of the house so fast. I don't know what would have happened 
if that guy got a hold of me. Probably, it would have been the complete end of me. The Basement Door by Saki Lingu my parents live next door to a small red house. Our backyard faces the side of their house which has a deck and two large windows. Around front there was always at least three cars parked outside. All enough in the ten years I'd lived there. I have never saw anyone enter or leave. Once, when I was twelve, I saw shadows thrown against the far wall that was visible through one of their windows. When my sister moved out, I took her bedroom, a large, open converted space in the basement which had a door and an outdoor stairwell which led to the backyard. A door had a small window on it, which my sister had covered with a Pulp Fiction poster. I redecorated and replaced the poster with some of those sheer half-curtain things. The way the room was set up, if I was lying in bed or sitting on the couch, I was facing the door. When I first moved down there, I noticed that sometimes at night, I would hear the sounds of leaves crunching in the stairwell. I chalked it up to be my cat. He liked the room in the neighborhood, and I had no reason to expect otherwise until a few, a few weeks later. One night, when my parents were away on business, my boyfriend and I were sitting on the couch smoking. Suddenly, he got really stiff and was just staring at the window. I asked him what was wrong and he said, I, s I s just saw a camera flash. I kind of just laughed it off, chalked it up being, being high. Who would want a picture of two people getting stoned? Still, the seeds of paranoia had been sown, and it wasn't easy to get settled down for sleep that night. I kept looking at the gap between the curtains. There was no light at that bottom of the stairs. So if someone really was down there, I'd be none the wiser. At around three, I heard distinct sounds of leaves under heavy boots. Definitely not a cat. I don't know what make me decide to best course of action was for me standing all of 5-3 to confront a potential stalker myself. I didn't even put on shoes. I the door to open. There was no one in the stairwell. So I ran up to the stairs in the backyard. Standing there was a man in his mid-forties. Maybe six feet tall, wearing one of those mechanic jumpsuits. He was holding a clunky, outdated digital camera. He stood there for a second, just looking at each other. He seemed confused to see me. After what felt like an attorney, I remember how to speak. What the fuck are you doing? My voice seemed to startle him and he immediately turned. And he ran through the backyard, towards the red house, and into the dark. After that, I didn't see any strange flashes of light. Or hear any crunchy leaf noises. It really freaks me out to think how many nights he could have just been standing there, in the dark, watching me. Creepy photographer. Let's not meet. For anyone who was asking, neither of my siblings had any en encounters with the dude I saw. My sister was putting the poster over the window, block out the light, because the idea of the window facing her bed made her anxious. Not because she had ever had a stalker, she forgot to mention to me. A mirror's lie. Cornelia closed the door behind her in a hurry. Her hands moved swiftly towards the key inside of her pocket and locked it. A loud bang was heard from the other side of the door. The man had been chasing her down, and now she had nowhere to go. Locked inside a room without windows. She stepped away from the door and moved backwards. She yelped as he slammed his fist on the door again. I know you're in here. Open this damn door, he yelled. Cornelia took a deep breath, her eyes wide open from fear, as she was unsure what her next move should be. She turned around shaky and insecure. There were two more women inside of the room. When her eyes met theirs, she finally spoke up. I can do this. Please, let me go home. Cornelia cried out. The woman on the right gave her a stern look. It seemed so icy cold that Cornelia was not sure 
it was safe to be inside or outside of the room she was standing in. This is our job. You signed up for this. You need to learn how to finish it. The woman on the right replied. Signed up? You forced me to do this. This is my life, my body. You can decide for me. She asked back. The woman on the left had covered her ears for a moment and gave Cornelia a shy look. Cornelia? I did not like it either the first time, but you'll learn to cope with this. Besides, what are we going to do if our boss finds out? Cornelia looked at her feet for a moment when that comment was dropped. She covered her face with her hands and tears began to stream down. Do you think it will make a difference? Either that guy or our boss is going to kill us, Emma! The woman on the right gave her an angry look. I am not going to let anyone harm us or even lay a finger on us. There are three of us and only one on the other side of that door. We can do this, but only if you take the courage and step outside. Another bang on the door was hit. It was not as powerful as our last couple of ones. Cornelia could hear the man drop to his knees. She turned around and looked at the door. Please, let me in. I need to talk to you. This is not who you are. The woman started to feel pity for the man. A part of her now indeed wanted to open the door, but not for the reason the two girls gave. She turns back to face the two. Emma looked in her eyes. Please, Cornelia, do it for us. She said as tears were falling from her face on the floor. Don't listen to them, the man on the other side screamed. There was fear in his voice. Take the scalpel from the bag we gave you. There should be a small bag of powder inside of it as well. It's devil's breath. So it should keep him under for a couple of hours. We need to harvest his organs, or else the boss will take ours. Cornelia nodded the response. Very well then. Claire, you win. But after today, you won't hear from me again. Cornelia cut open the small bag and dropped some powder on the palm of her hand. She looked back one last time at the mirror and turned to the door. Her two reflections vanished as she stepped closer. This is my body, she thought, but also our body. She took a deep breath and unlocked the door. A man with brown hair and green eyes was sitting on the floor. He looked at her, puzzled, for a slight second before realizing his fate. His face changed into a look that can only be described as disappointed and frightened. He stood up and made an attempt to throw a punch. Cornelia blew the powder into his face, and she saw how he dropped to the floor. Nice job, Emma said. Let's get to work, Claire replied. I must have been six or seven when I lived in Lebanon. The country was ravaged by war at the time, and murders were common and frequent. I remember during a particularly vicious era when the bombings rarely stopped, I would stay at home sitting in front of my television and watching a very, very strange show. It was a kid's show that lasted about 30 minutes and contained strange and sinister images. To this day, I believe it was a thinly veiled attempt on part of the media to use scare tactics to keep us kids in place, because the moral of every episode revolved around a very uptight ideology. Stuff like, bad kids stay up late, or bad kids have their hands under the covers when they sleep, and bad kids steal food from the fridge at night. It was very weird, and in Arabic to top it off. I didn't understand much of it, but... For the most part, the images were very graphic and comprehensive. The thing that stuck with me the most, however, was the closing scene. It remained much the same in every episode. The camera would zoom in 
on an old, rusted, closed door. As he got closer to the door, strange and sometimes even agonizing screams would become more audible. It was extremely frightening, especially for children's programming. Then a text would appear on the screen in Arabic reading, That's where bad kids go. Eventually both the image and the sound would fade out, and that would be the end of the episode. About 15 or 16 years later, I became a journalistic photographer. That show had been in my mind all my life, popping up in my thoughts sporadically. Eventually, I had enough and decided to do some research. I finally managed to uncover the location of the studio where much of that channel's programming had been recorded. Upon further research and eventually traveling on site, I found it was now desolate and had been abandoned after the big war ended. I entered the building with my camera. It was burnt out from the inside. Either a fire had broken out or someone had wanted to incinerate all the wooden furniture. After a few hours of cautiously making my way into the studio and snapping pictures, I found an isolated, out-of-the-way room. Having to break through a few old locks and managing to break the heavy door open, I remained frozen in the doorway for several long minutes. Traces of blood, feces, and tiny bone fragments lay scattered across the floor. It was a small room, and extremely morbid scene. What truly frightened me though, what made me turn away and never want to come back, was the bolted, caged microphone hanging from the ceiling in the middle of the room. For preference, I'm a male, and this happened to me in the spring of 2006 after trying to come home from a friend's house party. I was 23 at the time, and I was in college. I was going for a degree in graphic design, but I kind of slacked off in some of my classes, and sometimes I hardly go to class at all, and hung around a group of friends in this one spot in college I used to go to. I was also in a relationship at the time, and she was encouraging me to try to finish up school. For privacy reasons, let's call her Allison. She'll come into the story later. It was a warm spring day and I came to the group as usual and one of them spoke up. A female. Let's call her Joanna, or Joe for short. She announced that she was having a party over at her house later that night and everyone that was there wasn't invited. Knowing my luck, I wouldn't be. I mean, think about it. I was 23 had long hair, and I dressed like I was a hardy boy reject. Wrestlers, not the books. <sighs> Don't judge me. I spoke up and told everyone to have fun, but Joe interjected and she said, You're invited too. I said, um... Are you sure? Yes, just don't drink too much and mix the wrong liquors like last time, Joe said. What she meant by that was that I had a bad history of not controlling my liquor and I tend to say things that may not make people too happy with me. I couldn't drink anyway since I promised Allison that I would take her dress shopping the next day because my brother invited me and her at her niece's sweet 16. The day went on and the time of the party was on around 7 or so. Everyone in the group was there, including some other people that didn't go to college. The party went on for hours. I was hoping someone would offer me a ride home, but since no one did, I decided to go ahead and walk home because I made a promise to Allison. Joe and the others were pretty much wasted, but insisted on me to stay until the buses were active, but I was stubborn and I wanted to be up early to spend the day with my girlfriend. So I refused to start walking, all pissed off or whatnot. Granted, the house was like a two hour walk from Joe's place, but, but I walked distance longer than that and I turned out fine. That night wasn't my lucky night. It was around 2 in the morning, and I was walking through a bad area of town. In the corner of my eye, I saw the lights of an old beat-up car drive up slowly behind me, creeping up like something out of an old Stephen King movie. 
At first I thought I was somebody trying to score rocks since this area was the drug capital of the city. Bad time to be unarmed too. I tried to quicken my pace to try to lose it, and when I turned back, the car turned the corner into another part of the neighborhood. I sighed in relief and continued my journey. I get further from the neighborhood and I see the car again, this time coming towards me. I was thinking it was going to pass, but I was wrong. The car stopped in front of me, and one guy crept out of the driver's side. I told him, uh, sorry dude, I'm not holding. He replied, it's not rocks I want from you, as he pulled a gold-plated gun and pointed it at me, demanding me for money. But two other guys wearing masks came out of the car, and that's when I realized one was bigger than the other two. They were pretty much a different version of Randy, Troy, and Keith before anybody knew about them. I tried to bolt to the other side, but the big guy grabbed the collar of my shirt and threw me down, and I was at gunpoint once again. Mind you, I had nothing to defend myself with. No gun, no knife, no taser, not even MMA experience. They demanded money from me, and all I had at the time was seven bucks. I did as they told and handed them the money, hoping they would leave. The man with the gun said, Have a nice day before pistol wiping me to the ground and walking to their car, leaving me in a pool of blood. But then the man with the gun said, On second thought, and walked back towards me and pointed the gun at my head. I was shaking in terror, thinking if this was my last night on earth, but I was relieved when a pair of flashing red lights came out of nowhere and thugs got back in their car and drove off. The lights stopped in front of me, but it was an ambulance who happened to pass by after her call. They put me in a stretcher and took me to the hospital. The police took a statement from me, and then the next day I got a tongue lashing from Allison telling me it was a bad idea to go out in the night. But she forgave me in the end. I was just so thankful to be alive, and I know never to walk at night unarmed again. There's this church in my town that is very creepy and supposedly a cult. Subsequently, me and my fellow teenage friends wanted to check it out. For the past couple weeks, my friends and I have been driving through the back parking lot of the church to see what's up. We've noticed it was very creepy and had a very eerie atmosphere. Members have chased our cars, taken a picture of our license plate, and attempted to stop us. Besides that, which is a lot. Nothing really threatening has actually happened. Well, last night that changed. We were driving through the back at around 10 p.m. This church literally only has services at night. It's bizarre. When we saw a member pointing towards our car, we didn't want to be confronted, so we tried to exit. This is when a mob of around 20 church members started running towards our car, forcing us to stop. All the men are wearing tuxedos and the women dresses and wearing veils for some reason. They were surrounding our car, banging on our windows and chanting weird things. We are shitting ourselves. We didn't know what to do. We couldn't call the cops because the church was private property, so we were wrong for trespassing. My friend started taking out her phone to film and suddenly all of them just sprinted into different directions. It was so creepy and bizarre. I'm confused about why the church is so secretive and what goes on within the building. You literally can't make this shit up. You're surprised by the way I live my own life. Of course I have a garden. I love roses despite the thorns. Aren't the night blooming flowers lovely? Of course I sleep on silk sheets. They give me sweet dreams. Wouldn't you love such decadence? Of course I keep a well-stocked kitchen. I do have guests occasionally. Isn't the garlic braid decorative? Of course I sip human blood from crystal goblets. I serve it hot like sake. When you want a steak, do you kill a cow? Of course not. You have someone else do it for you. Much more civilized. Perhaps we're not so different after all.
When I first saw you, my mind came to a halt. Vision blurred, hands sweaty, my heart pumped hard by default. I am breathless. I am happy you understand, smiling at me while holding my hand. You beckoned and held me close, looking in my eyes, nose to nose. I am breathless. He brushed aside my hair, quietly humming a tune. Having me not have a care. The room is lit by the moon. I am breathless. You told me to trust you to end my pain. I did not understand. When you had cellophane. Screaming while you bound me to the bed. Frightened to have the plastic envelop my head. You laughed at my struggle and distress. You left me limp and breathless. I'll ask you a question. Have you ever been so terrified that even your own shadow fills you with terror? Yeah. That was the world I used to live in as a child growing up. Life had begun just as it continued throughout my childhood. An uphill battle. To have your birth celebrated and mourned. To be one half of a whole. To lose a twin brother you never knew, but never forgot. I don't remember when the trouble began, but the creeping terror has been a constant companion. I have vague recollections and deftly cold feelings. I recall my parents rushing me to the hospital with mysterious injuries that only got worse over time. Having been cleared of any abuse allegations, they found that while almost every other child growing up had a fear of the dark, they noticed I was different, for I was utterly afraid of the light. Not the actual light itself, you understand, but by being in the light. My first actual full memory was when I was about five. My parents had left the nightlight on whilst I slept and they were awoke by the most blood-curdling cries you should never hear from a child's lips. They ran in to find a boy being throttled to within an inch of his life, sickening marks seared into the flesh of his neck. And from that point on, I refused to sleep alone with any sort of light on, or to be unmonitored ever again. As I grew older, the attacks grew more frequent. Always in the light, though. Never in total darkness. My parents, along with what little friends I had, would notice strange little quirks I developed as I grew older. By day, I would always stick to the shadows as best I could when I was alone. When at home, my room was set, so when I had the lights on, a suspended blanket would cast a protective pool of shade across most of my room. This went on for much of my pre-teens. Sometimes I'd get sloppy, though, and like a shark having smelt blood in the waters, it would strike. So violent, so filled with rage, as if trying to inflict as much pain as it could knowing it might well never have another chance. But the worst was yet to come. Oh yes, soon it found a voice. One night. Die! Utter terror woke me from sleep, the fading sound of malicious cackling drifting away. I knew with a heavy sinking feeling this was something I couldn't win alone. Unfortunately, I made a mistake. No, I made the mistake. I told my parents. To hear your child is hearing voices is not something you want to hear as a parent. For them, this was another issue in a long line of bizarre behaviours. And that, for them, was the final straw. I can't in all honesty remember how many psychiatrists I saw, or how many tests were performed. But for me, it was all the same answer anyway. It's all in your head. I began to stop trying to prove the existence of this thing. It tormented me when I was alone, and then it tormented me when I was with people, by not doing anything, making it frustratingly impossible to prove anything. The constant vitriol it spewed wore me down, for violence was not the only way it had found to harm me. The hissing little whispers, the kind that force the hairs on the back of your neck to stand on end far better than any icy chill ever will, stripped me away of any last resolve I had. I had nothing left to give. Nowhere to turn, and no one left to talk to. On my 12th birthday, I awoke in the hospital, 
I still remember the screams of hatred in my ears as my leg was snapped backwards. A wet tearing sound as my shoulder parted to the roars of, It's your fault! And the feeling of my throat being crushed as easily as a tin can. And the words, Why did you get to live? Fading. Slowly. As I faded to nothingness. I had given up, you see. I couldn't take any more. The well of despair was full. And my only hope for it to end was to remove the protective blankets around my room. And switch the lights on. I'm sure at one point I had died. It's threat fulfilled. I almost wish I'd stayed dead. Now, you might think this is where the story ends. But no. They brought me back. Back to a world of pain and suffering. It's true what they say, though. When you hit rock bottom, you truly have nowhere else to go but up. But like I said, I almost wish I'd stayed dead. You see, in my darkest hour, I'd found what little strength a child could muster. Because, for the first time, for the first time ever, I now had a chance. For you see, it had messed up. So full of rage and hatred, so full of unbridled anger aimed at me, and only me, that it had made a mistake. For in its attempt to finally finish its threats to kill me, it had unwittingly revealed itself. I now knew, not what it was, but who it was. I bided my time, making sure I was protected until I was certain. For now I knew I had to confront a tragedy twelve years in the making. Summoning what courage a young boy could, I hobbled my way to the hospital showering rooms. I'd found that late at night they were normally unoccupied and ideal for what was to come. Flicking switches, bulbs winked and shone to life. I stood there, light washing over me and spilling out around me, casting an elongated shadow of myself out in front of me all along the cold, wet tiles. For a minute or two, nothing happened. Then, a low animalistic hiss echoed around me. One of frustration, of denial, and then it twitched. The black mass of my own shadow moved on its own accord. Feeling my fear well up, I stood my ground. The dark silhouette bellowed with devilish malice as it moved like grease in a frying pan. With the speed of lightning, the shadow of my own hand lashed out like an uncoiling whip. But before the blow could land, it hesitated, as I uttered but three words. No more, brother, from one child to another, from one brother to the other. I loved your memory, I began. Eyes fixed on the withering dark shape in front of me. Through high-pitched squeals I yelled, Your death was not my fault, and I am not to blame. Like a wounded animal, the shadow recoiled. It lashed out. The blow struck home, but what little strength there was faded fast. I forgive you. For everything. I said. Because that's what brothers do. They look out for each other. Another strike, but this time it barely phased me, the shadow of my own hand largely passing straight through me. It should have been you and me against the world, side by side, not on opposite ends. I could hear the screaming slowly fade into a child sobbing. As I fell down to my knees, wincing at the pain, I reached out, placing a gentle hand on the shadow of my own face. Please rest. And no... You were never forgotten, and you never will be. The epic showdown, you ask? The final boss fight? Sorry to disappoint, but not that day. Because sometimes all someone needs to hear is that they are loved, and that they are never forgotten, and that their memory will live on. For that night, two brothers reconciled, and finally learned what it meant to be family.
Several years ago, someone who I thought was a friend brutally stabbed me in the head. I didn't feel the knife going into my skull, but I could feel the wet warmth of blood gushing out of the wound. Once I realized what was going on, I jerked backward and screamed, Oh my fucking God, what are you doing? With blood pouring down my face, I ran to find something to stop the bleeding. Oh my God, I'm going to die, I yelled. The thought of dying in such a violent way is a fear I never want to experience again. It took surgeons 11 surgical staples to seal all of my wounds. I was later told that it was a near fatal stabbing. That day has forever changed me as a person. Who I am now is not a victim, but a survivor. This happened when I was in junior in high school. I was 16 years old when I was invited to one of my friend's birthday party. A lot of really scary things happened to me in this period of my life, living in this area. But this is one of the scariest events. I lived pretty close to my school in a nearby apartment complex. Then in the middle of a big city, so most of the time, I just biked the 5 to 7 minutes to school. The party wasn't until 4.30, so the plan was for me to bike back home to change, drop off my bike walk to dinner to the next complex, and wait until I could get picked up there. I get home to change clothes and grab a bag to put my ukulele and other essentials with me. My ukulele didn't fit in my bag, so I zipped it up on both sides so the top was visible. I grab my keys and I'm off. Now to get an idea of how the parking lot was set up, the entire complex had a gate with short wall and a metal fence around the top of it. The cars were all lined around the gate and crossed it with 30 to 40 apartment buildings in between. I happened to live right on the corner of the car gate, but to avoid the public I usually walk inside the gate till I get to the other end, where there's a small gate door that looks locked, but never is. I was walking down the sidewalk, passing the apartments, when I see two men across from me on the street. One of them turned and looked directly at me. I initially thought something was off, but I didn't really think much of it and simply avoided them since I was close to the gate door anyway. After a bit, he started to walk slightly adjacent from me and next to the cars. He looked to be at least in his mid-40s. He had dark hair and tan skin that didn't seem like he took good care of himself. He suddenly asked me, what kind of instrument is that? Referring to the ukulele in my backpack. Now I dumbly responded very briefly, ukulele, and ignored him since I was still very young and it was just my first reaction. I immediately regretted it since he started to pace up just a little more and he started to ask, what's your name? At this point I got a sinking gut feeling. I knew that I needed to get out of there. My fight or flight kicked and in and started to quicken my pace. As expected, he started to do the same, but his friendly tone switched quickly and he started repeating himself, but more aggressively. I started to run at this point and he did the same. Thank God there happened to be another younger man at the end of the gate who saw me sprinting to the gate. I started to wave towards the man asking for help while panting from the sprinting and sheer adrenaline shooting through my body. He quickly noticed everything happening, opened the gate for me to let me through, and proceeded to block the way from the man previously chasing me. I sprinted all the way to the diner, telling them how I was chased and asking them to sit in a seat away from the windows. The team was very polite and helpful overall. They brought me water and allowed me to wait until my friend arrived. I can't imagine what would have happened in an alternative situation. I wish I could thank the man that helped me. 
I don't know if I would have been fast enough if it wasn't for him. Now I refuse to walk anywhere by myself and only bike or drive if I need to. Have you ever heard of the story of Maria Labo? It's a Filipino urban legend about a woman who ate little children. The story starts with a young couple, Maria and Damien, living in a small town in western Visayas. Damien was a police officer and Maria was a homemaker who looked after their kids, Toto and their baby infant Inde. Though happy in their humble home, they struggled to make ends meet. The desire to provide a better life for her family prompts Maria to apply for a job in Dubai. She returns years later, much to Damien's delight, and things seemingly return to normal even as terror seems to strike the town. Bodies of children turn up, shocking the people in the community. This causes Damien to worry when his own children don't come to greet him one afternoon. As he is searching, he finds his wife battering a chopping block with her cleaver as she furiously minces pieces of meat. Damien continues to search as Maria begins to cook. Maria tells her husband to quit worrying, encouraging him to stop looking for the children and enjoy the meal she prepped first. She leaves him to eat to inspect something outside, and as soon as she leaves, sobbing from under the table draws Damien's attention. He finds their son, Toto, curled up on the floor and staring at the refrigerator. Damien hurries to his feet to find out what the boy is looking at, and as he opens the refrigerator door, it becomes apparent that all is now well with his wife. Hacked limbs from little children are crammed inside the fridge. He races to their baby's cradle and grows cold when he finds it empty. Damien takes his bolo knife and looks for his wife. He sees her just outside their house, crouched over something he cannot identify just yet. In her mouth are the internal organs of an infant. The world dims and all Damien could do was strike her face, leaving a scar. Maria becomes an urban legend in the region, her name derived from the Filipino word for slash, which is labo. The dark web ruined my life. I only went on because I knew my uncle used to. He's really good with computers, so I guess I got my skill with technology from him. I'm not gonna say how I got on there because I don't want to make it easier for others to make the same mistake I did. Anyways, after a little while of looking around, I found a link titled Hypnotizing Scenery. I don't know what compelled me to click on it. I hadn't planned to click on anything at all. I just wanted to look around a bit to soothe my curiosity, I suppose. When I clicked on it though, well, it was weird. At first it was a bunch of normal scenery, pictures of mountains, old castles, oceans, normal stuff. Then the pictures started changing faster and faster. I couldn't even really make out what the pictures were of anymore. I saw a lot of red, like maybe blood, on clothes. Maybe a mattress. I'm not sure, but it also looked like there was words. I'm not sure, but it also looked like there were words over the pictures. I couldn't read. I couldn't read what they said in time before it switched pictures again. Suddenly, it ended with a blank screen, with white text that read, Good luck. I feel like I should mention that this was all about 30 seconds. After it ended, I shut down everything and got into bed. The next morning when I woke up, I had this horrible migraine. It just wouldn't go away. When I went to school, everyone seemed so loud and annoying. This one kid, Anthony in particular, was driving me insane. He kept poking me with his pencil, as he did every day. I'd tell him to stop, but he would just laugh. As he did this, I kept thinking how great it would be to rip his arm out of its socket. Maybe poke him with a pencil in the throat, see how he likes it. I had decided. The next time he poked me, I would kill him. One, two, three, four, poke. I snapped my head around, got up, 
and ripped the pencil from his hand so hard he fell out of his chair. I got on top of him and held the pencil to his throat, pressing harder and harder. He was grasping at my arms trying to get me off of him, but I felt stronger than ever. He couldn't manage to push me off as a trickle of blood began to run down the side of his neck. That's when the principal, vice principal, and three janitors managed to pull me off. Suddenly, I heard all the screaming and commotion. All 35 students crowded against the wall in the corner, with the teacher gasping for air, crying and backing up against her desk. My parents came and got me. My parents came and got me about 20 minutes later. The cops were never called, I guess, but... The cops were never called. The cops were never called, and I guess the kid's parents decided not to call them and press charges. I'm not sure why. I would've. I was expelled from school, however, and my parents were pretty angry. I don't know what came over me, but as I had the pencil against his throat, all I could think about was how great I felt. Invincible. Free. Powerful. Now, I just felt like the same 16 year old. 5 foot 3 inch 120 pound small girl I was the day before, and my migraine was back. Great. I remembered that it had started to fade away as I tackled Anthony. I tried to get to sleep, but all I could think about was how he got away. I wanted him dead, bloody on the ground and gasping for breath. I wanted to kill him. I wanted to be... I wanted to be the last thing he saw before he died. I couldn't believe I was thinking this way. I've never been a violent person, but now that I was thinking about it, I didn't care who it was. I just wanted to kill someone. Not just kill them, but torture them. I decided to go back to that page to see if I could find some answers. It was that Link that did this to me. Turned me into some kind of monster. There it was. Hypnotizing scenery. This time when I clicked on it though, it was a list. A set of rules. Number one, always finish the kill. If you don't, the migraine will worsen quickly and you'll be dead within four months. Number two, take it slow. Don't finish it off too soon or the migraine will return faster. Number three, don't be stupid. Don't get caught. Number four, leave the mark. Something for them to remember me. A small J carved into their forehead. Number five, you are my creation. I made you to continue my legacy. Don't fight it. It's not worth it. I'm now 26 years old and I've killed a countless number of people. Anthony was my first official kill. Only three months after the incident, when I couldn't handle the migraine anymore. I don't think that I'm me anymore. My creator will probably see this and might end me, but I wanted to write this as a warning before the monster takes over again. Don't go on the dark web. It's not worth it. Hello, my name is Kara, and if you're hearing this, I need your help. I was cleaning out my attic when I came across an old cassette tape. Thinking it was just some high school kid's mixtape, I popped it into my mom's old tape player to see what cringeworthy songs may be on it. Had I only known what it really was, I would have thrown it into the fireplace without a second thought. And oh, how I wish I would have. Instead of being greeted with the familiar sounds of mbop or one of the various jock jams, the tape simply contained the voice of a young girl. She explained that she had stumbled upon something otherworldly and was now caught in a dimension somewhere between life and death. She could see and hear all of her loved ones, but had no way to interact with them. The only thing that responded to her touch was an old tape recorder. So she made the tape in hopes that someone on the outside could help her. I did all the research I could, but my time has run out. Sadly, I must pass this message on to you in hopes that you can find the answers I couldn't. There's just one more thing. 
you now have four days to hopefully find the answers I couldn't, or I will take your place and you will take mine. I'm sorry I deceived you, but I had no other choice. Since I could not find the answers in time, I have become the girl on the tape, and I had no other option but to pass it on. For your sake, I hope you can find the answers I couldn't. About five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the US. I've always been a night person, so I'd often find myself bored after my roommate, who was decidedly not a night person, went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go out for long walks and spend the time thinking. I spent four years like that, walking alone at night, and never once had a reason to feel afraid. I always used to joke with my roommate that even the drug dealers in the city were polite, but all of that changed in just a few minutes in one evening. It was a Wednesday. Somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning, and I was walking near a police patrolled park quite a few ways from my apartment. It was a quiet night, even for a weeknight, with very little traffic and almost no one on foot. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I turned down a side street in order to loop back into my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of my street, on my side, was a silhouette of a man dancing. It was a strange dance similar to a waltz, but he finished each box with an awkward stride. I guess you could say he was dance walking, heading straight for me. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me by. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall and lanky and wearing an old suit. He danced closer still until I could make out his face. His eyes were open and wild, head tilted back slightly, looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. Between the eyes and the smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off him to cross the empty street. As I reached the other side, I glared back and then stopped dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street, perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me, but looking skyward, smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again, but kept my eyes on the man. He didn't move. Once I had about a half a block between us, I turned away from him for a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me. The street and sidewalk ahead of me were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments, I felt relieved until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I couldn't tell for sure due to the distance and the shadows, but I was certain he was facing me. I had looked away for him for no more than 10 seconds, so it was clear he had moved fast. I was so shocked I stood there for some time staring at him, and then he started moving towards me. He took tall, exaggerated, toe-tipped steps as if he was a cartoon character sneaking up on someone, except he was moving very, very quickly. I'd like to say at this point I ran away or pulled out my pepper spray or my cell phone or anything at all, but I didn't. I just stood there, completely frozen, as the smiling man crept towards me. And then he stopped again, about a car length away from me, still smiling his smile, still looking to the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to say was, What the fuck do you want? In an angry, commanding tone, what came out was a whimper. What the fuck? Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. I heard it in my own voice, and that only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there, smiling. And then, after what felt like forever, he turned around, very slowly started dance walking away just like that not wanting to turn my back to him again i just watched him go until he was far enough away to almost be out of sight and then i realized something he wasn't moving away anymore nor was he dancing i watched in horror as the distant shape of him grew larger and larger he was coming back my way and this time he was running i ran too i ran until i was off of the side road and back into a better lit road with sparse traffic 
Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of the way home I kept glaring over my shoulder, always expecting to see his stupid smile, but he was never there. I lived in that city for six months after that night, and I never went out for another walk. It was something about his face that always haunted me. He didn't look drunk, he didn't look high, he looked completely and utterly insane, and that's a very, very scary thing to see. First, I'd like to thank Ghosty Mist for having me on, and congratulate him on reaching 1k. He truly deserves it and many more. Now, I have two stories to tell you. This happened back when I was in college. I'm 28 now, but would have been 23 at the time. I was taking a road trip with some friends. We were going to one of their houses for Thanksgiving. The place was a couple of states away, and we were taking turns driving through the night to get there as fast as we could. It's about a 24 hour drive if you don't stop, though it does take you through some very desolate and isolated areas. If you've ever been up north in late November, then you know you can get hit by some wild freak snowstorms. We were on I-94 about an hour outside of Fargo and had been driving for 10 hours already when we got hit by a sudden blizzard. It had been raining all day, so once the temperature dropped, the roads were ice. The person driving during this time was from the south and had never driven on ice before, so needless to say, we ended up in the guardrails. Maybe it was the blizzard, or maybe we were just in a dead zone, but none of our phones had service. With it being as late as it was, and with the storm going, there weren't many people on the road. Probably about an hour later, a trucker stopped and asked what was wrong. Could have been his yellow teeth, or his greasy hair, or the fact that he smelled like cat piss, but he instantly gave me a bad vibe. He pulled over and asked what was wrong, like it wasn't obvious. He even asked if he could look under the hood for us to try and fix it. Dude, the whole front end is smashed. Even if the engine was working, we're not going anywhere. We asked if he could radio someone on his CB to give us a tow. He said his CB was out, remember this for later. He then said that he could give us a lift into town, which was, like I mentioned before, over an hour away, but he could only take one of us. At first, he said he would take Charlene, the only female with us, but like hell that was going to happen. We told him no, that we would rather one of the guys go with them so that they could explain the situation to the tow truck better. Honestly, Charlene knew cars and could tell someone what was wrong, but we weren't about to let him know that. He then started making excuses about how he was running behind and that he had to turn before Fargo anyways and was only trying to help. He started making his way back into the cab of his truck when a voice came over his CB radio. We could hear it clear as day when he opened the door. He didn't say anything else but hopped in and drove off leaving us there to freeze. Fortunate for us, Highway Patrol came by about half an hour later and got us some help. To this day, I freak out a little thinking of what would have happened to Charlene if we had let her go with him. We never did end up making it to Michigan and stayed in Fargo for two days while the car got fixed. I live out in the middle of nowhere and my house is about two miles back from the main road at that, so it's pretty secluded you could say. Last week, I was sitting in my living room about to watch a movie. It was around 10 at night. It's just me and my wife out there and we've never had a reason to feel unsafe. My wife was in the bedroom, she had gone to bed early. Anyways, I was out in the living room when I heard the sound of tires driving down the gravel. Even inside, you can hear when a car comes down the road, since I hadn't started the movie, it was dead quiet. This gets my hair on end, especially since I couldn't see any headlights. So many questions filled my mind. Why was someone here so late, and why were they running without lights on? I had the lights off in the house, so it probably looked like no one was awake, and whoever it was most likely hadn't noticed the television from the living room. 
Next, I hear a car door quietly shut. Clearly, they were trying not to make any noise, but I could still hear the door latch when pushed closed. After that, there were boots walking up my porch. I slowly made my way to my gun cabinet, slid the key in the lock, and took out my pump shotgun. On tiptoes, I made my way to the front door to listen if I could hear anyone talking. I could make out two different male voices. My heart was thumping in my chest, even with a loaded shotgun in my hand. My mouth was dry when they tried the doorknob. I thought about opening it up to see what they wanted, but that seemed dumb since they had come down the driveway with lights off. I doubt they wanted anything good. I saw the shadow of one of them come in through the bay window and knew he was going around back. Last thing I wanted was to be surrounded. So I gave the shotgun a pump and yelled for them to get off my property before I started blasting. I gave a quick peek around the corner of the window and saw the two of them vault over the porch railing and run back to their car. I can tell you they left with their lights on this time, but unfortunately I was blinded by them so I didn't get a description of the vehicle. I'm going to install a security camera and maybe even a gate down the driveway now because I can't even imagine what would have happened had I been asleep already and not there to scare them off before they got Hell, a truly frightening universe of evil, chaos, and darkness, devoid of all hope like those born from the light, divine children of God, angels, fallen in disgrace and cast out as punishment for their betrayal, lie here for eternity, seething with hatred, plotting revenge against the creator and his other children. Humans. With the war, the dark skies of hell tear open, and from it, crashing down too many to count, are the recently deceased. Dazed and frightened, immediately they will be preyed upon, many of them kicking and screaming in terror as they are dragged away violently by the fallen, now known as demons, who will soon take pleasure in inflicting gruesome, unspeakable torments on these souls who, before death, committed acts of depravity and evil. They, especially the others without remorse for their crimes, truly are damned to suffer for eternity in all nine circles of this unholy kingdom. More cattle to be slaughtered. I reply to my brothers, so to speak. Unlike the rest, looking to pass the millennia tormenting the wicked for pleasure. I believe their torments is dark, but ultimately just punishments for their crimes on earth against the innocent. Yes, I believe in justice. Those humans like them with no empathy or remorse for their crimes have earned their afterlife here. Hell, after all, was created by God to be an eternal prison. Why am I telling you all this? To chronicle a mission in progress. My name is Actually, it's been so long since I used my true name, when I was human, that is. I didn't come here like the rest because of great crimes, no. I'm here because I wished it. I made a deal with the adversary himself, while dying a slow, painful death from heartbreak and betrayal. On Earth, I was a good man. From birth, I suffered from chronic poor health, resulting in during a number of surgeries. With all this going on, growing up, I was quite lonely. Searching for true friends, I would be taken advantage of by others time and time again. All I had was my faith and prayers to God to deliver me from this loneliness. A darkness I would later come to know, ironically. As an adult, I believe my prayers were answered when I met her. A woman who was different. Alexandra. A woman who I thought way too amazing and beautiful to notice me. Well, she did, and we became friends. She was my first and only true friend. Months passed, I felt so blessed to have her in my life, and I couldn't help it. I fell in love with her. After some more time, believing I had come to know her, believing her to be my one true love, with a ring I had bought ready in hand, I proposed. 
asking her to marry me. Within moments, and a smile, she said yes, and we embraced. After our wedding, she gave me the best news of my life. She was pregnant with my son. I would never be lonely anymore, for soon I would have a family of my own. This woman, my wife, soon to be mother of my child, is ultimately why I am telling you all this. Because she killed me, poisoning me slowly in cold blood for insurance money. Why then did I not proceed to heaven being a victim? Madness? No. Justice. Before you judge me, no, I learned horrible truths about her and the various crimes she committed before we met. Not by God, but his fallen son, Lucifer, who I refused to believe at first. The fact I was dying was traumatic enough. However, he showed me a series of visions revealing she was only with me to take out an insurance policy on my life after marrying me, and knowing my often poor health, what foods I could actually eat. I saw how she poisoned me, and remember in retrospect how I was so sick. It had to be true. Everything in my body and soul felt it. Add to the fact he stated, Why would I lie about a woman who for beauty pledged her soul to me many years ago and has found certain means to deny me my payment? I intend to collect by any means necessary. With your help, perhaps? He remarked, smirking. My life was over, but I thought of my child's life. He's in danger now, and I realized I must bring her justice to save him. To do all this, I will need to become something else other than human. Something in the end not worthy of heaven or God. As loudly as possible, I accepted Lucifer's offer and we agreed upon a deal. In the future, I pray I will be forgiven. But until then, I go into my mission. As per the deal made upon my death, the soon I was to arrive in hell, immediately I was to be left alone by the others, and afterwards guided by a top-level demon into a fleshy chamber in the sixth circle, one of many of hell's chambers there used to siphon power off of damned souls. Once placed in there like a cocoon, I would be in a state of unconsciousness, seeing everything in my life before death and dreaming of a stolen future. In this state of suspended animation, the chamber would begin a process unto me known as apotheosis, a transformation permanently from human into a demon. The chamber siphoning off small amounts of power from my immortal soul. The soul itself being semi-divine and using an ancient forbidden form of alchemy would take that very energy and combine it with hell's energies, condensing it with the power and weight of sin itself, creating new matter, molecule by molecule, cell by cell, grafted onto my soul with the finished creation, a new demon body, powered by my soul. My rebirth eventually happened with the chamber opening and me falling onto the ground. Like a butterfly emerged from its cocoon, I felt dizzy. But soon coming to, I rose up slowly, gifted with a new form. I looked human, but with new demonic flesh and blood, powered by a changed immortal soul. Feeling a strength never felt before, I cast my eye on a nearby pillar made of the only rock that exists here, brimstone, the very foundation of hell. With my fist clenched and tightened, I surged forward with great inhuman speed. Fist first, destroying the massive pillar in one blow, whose crumbling rivaled only the chaotic sounds of hell in volume. Looking at my fist, I saw no damage, and most of all, felt no pain just raw power surging through me. I knew with this new body I could take justice upon Alexandra and most importantly find and deliver my child from her evil. Soon the palace in the last circle, the ninth, 
where the Prince of Darkness sits on his throne, will call upon me to enter one of the many portals or Hellmouths back to Earth, as agreed in our deal. Every soul with its semi-divinity collected and siphoned off of using those chambers I was reborn from amplifies Lucifer in Hell. Apparently, Alexandra's soul, once innocent, is now corrupted and pure evil from her many sins. Hell lusts to siphon off of her darkness. But as all can be seen from heaven or here, one problem arose. After my death, Alexandra will the money from life insurance, saw fit to enter herself into the dark world of black magic and the occult, to gain further wealth and power. Her greed truly knew no bounds, placing my only child into further danger. With black magic, she may have learned his location would be obscured, and she would be well protected. Learning this information, I consulted Lucifer, and he agreed to amend our deal. Arriving back on Earth, I would contact seven people fiercely loyal to him, practitioners in various disciplines of black magic. Their teachings and knowledge I would learn from, giving me the powers and abilities needed to enhance my demonic body to achieve my mission. One promise I made myself, though, most importantly, was I would harm no innocence in my mission. I couldn't care for my son with my fate sealed, but I would deliver him to a worthy family in despair for a child to love as their own, a family who will genuinely love him as I do. This is my eternal gift to him, a new life free from his mother's mistakes. Spending my last hours in preparation here and where I arrived so long ago, I ready myself to return to Earth to confront my demon and to reunite with my child. Reflecting on everything, I look down on my bloodstained hands and look up to the empty dark skies of hell I've come to know for so long. I whisper softly, my eyes closed, Grandma, I'm sorry I can't join you in paradise, but know forever I'll always love you. Opening my eyes, I finish with, but I will stop her and save your great-grandson. Soon, as was promised, the order comes for my return. A massive portal opens. Again, looking up to the skies, I see it, opening my arms to embrace it, find myself ascending into the air as it sucks me towards it. I head now towards my destiny. Will I succeed in taking justice upon Alexandra and save my son? From here on out, only God knows. Follow me if you dare. For this fallen star rises. rises. I encountered my first stalker when I was in 7th grade. This may not seem relevant now, but... This was around 2007 to 2009-ish, back when MySpace was a thing. This will be relevant later. I'm a relatively nice guy, so I'm friendly to most people I meet. At the end of the school day, I would have a math class with a girl I'll call Sarah. I was assigned to work with her on a project where, I guess this all began. She was not attractive at all. She had this greasy hair that was disgusting. She smelled terrible, was a little overweight, and would wear the same clothes every day. Despite her looks, I was friendly. She was nice and I felt bad for her because I knew all the kids picked on her. Almost every day after that, I would check in on her and talk to her, even though I really didn't want to. She started getting comfortable around me and started liking me. She told me one day she loved me and asked me to be her boyfriend. I kindly rejected and said I liked someone else. Then things just got weird. She would tell me she loved me every day and started talking bad about every pretty girl in school she thought I liked. She would also stare at me in class, literally the whole 45 minutes this all started to creep me out, so I told a teacher. My teacher laughed in my face 
in such a rude way, telling me I was overreacting. I didn't know what to do. Ignoring Sarah and not talking to her didn't work because she would still stare at me and say ridiculous things to me. I started being mean to her. I made it clear I didn't want to talk to her. And I told her I will never like her. After a week or so of that strategy, I noticed cuts on her arms. She would lie about it at first, but the truth would finally come out. She told me she would take the sharpest knife in her house and cut herself because I didn't love her. She would also talk about how she was going to kill herself. She said it would be all my fault and I should choose the way she died. Obviously, I told her not to do it and told her to stop hurting herself. But I'll never forget how disturbing and sick I felt at her details. After that, I was nice to her again, ignoring the strange things she said. At the time, I had a huge crush on Miley Cyrus from the show Hannah Montana. She knew this. As time went on, I noticed her using many of the catchphrases from the show and doing some of the hand gestures from Miley. It was clear she practiced mimicking the show a lot. It got to the point where I couldn't even watch the show anymore because Sarah acted like her perfectly and it creeped me out too much. She would also make fake Miley Cyrus MySpace accounts sending me messages like, Why don't you like Sarah from your math class? I would always confront her about this, and the accounts would be deleted. As the school year went on, my teacher noticed her constant staring and would yell at her to stop. She never would stop, so she was moved to the other side of the room. She would still position herself to stare at me. She was then kicked out of class. I didn't see much of her after that, but sometimes in the hallway or lunch, she would always run up to me with a disposable camera and take pictures of me. I was tired of her creepy shit, so I told the vice principal about everything, and shortly after that, Sarah was put into a special needs school. Me and my parents would have to have a meeting about my safety with the principal, because the things she said she was going to do to me were disturbing. During the meeting, my principal kept saying the word disturbing over and over. That and the look of just concern on his face made me feel this was more serious than I thought. Yeah, well, it didn't end there. Fast forward a year and a half at the beginning of my ninth grade year. At this point, I haven't seen Sarah since she was kicked out of school. I was talking to a girl on MySpace who was very pretty. I didn't really like her personality, but it was tolerable. I told this girl I was going to be at my friend Greg's house and that she should hang out with us. She declined and said another time. Later that night, me and Greg were in his treehouse, which was right next to the road. I remember looking out at the street and seeing someone sitting on the curb, with their hood covering their face, staring down at something in their hand. We ignored it at first, but the person never went away. We told Greg's dad about the person, but they were gone before we could get there. The next morning, we walked over to the sidewalk and saw what I thought at first was a little piece of paper from a magazine. I picked it up and seen that it was just a thick piece of paper with crayon lines all over it. I turned the piece of paper over and noticed that it was a picture of me. My body froze in terror. I never seen this picture before in my life. It was a picture from a disposable camera, and in the picture, I was in the hallway at school. It must have been Sarah. She took this photo and was there last night. How, how did she know I was there? And why was she there? I instantly remembered I told that pretty girl from MySpace where I was that night. I then looked back at the girl's profile, but nothing seemed weird. She had comments and pictures from over a year ago, and she had over 300 friends. She would also publicly talk with friends on there, so the profile couldn't have been fake, right? I then looked at her friends' profiles that she was talking to. Each profile maybe had two pictures and weren't active unless they were talking to this girl. 
It was then clear that the pretty girl didn't exist, and that it was just Sarah. I sent her a message saying that she had to stay away from me, and that I was going to call the police. She responded by sending me a bunch of numbers followed by the words, I will make you feel. Minutes later, the accounts were deleted. The creepiest thing was that the account was active for over a year before she started talking to me. I still wonder what she was plotting to do. I haven't seen or heard from Sarah since, and it's been at least six years, but I don't think this is over. I truly think she's been planning something this whole time, and be back for some type of revenge. Hopefully, we will never meet again. I moved to my dad's when I was 10, and I didn't know anyone in the area, except for a family that my dad was friends with, a single mom with three kids. Luckily there was a girl, who was a couple years older than me. She was 12 at the time I met her, and we got to know each other over a couple of years. We weren't close, but we ended up having the same friends. One night, my friend Rob was hanging out with her and her younger brother. They happened to be in the house alone because my friend's mom was at work. Her mother has been helping this one lady through her work and got to know her fairly well. She found out her sister was in a mental institution and was let out recently. Tonight Rob was hanging out with my friend. They got a knock on the door. My friend thought it was her mother since she knocks a certain way before coming in. And he answered it without thinking. Rob wasn't supposed to be there so we took off through the window to his house down the road. He never gave it a second thought. It wasn't their mom. It was the sister of the lady her mom was helping, and she figured out through talking to her sister where her family lived and her mother's work schedule. She came in, and that's where I don't know the details, and I'm glad I don't. My friend's younger brother got away to the neighbor's house to call the police. The lady brutally murdered my friend a week from Christmas, decapitated her and left her body naked in a bathtub. She even hid her head. They had to look through presents and I don't know where they found it, but they did. I wasn't allowed to go to her funeral. Before I tell my story, let me set the scene. It was the summer of 1996 and I'm 15 years old. I grew up in a good neighborhood in a typical Swedish university town with my dad. I was a pretty well behaved kid, did good in school, didn't drink or smoke. In fact, I didn't want to go to parties. I didn't have a boyfriend, but I had a crush on a boy at school. And I felt pretty sure he was curious about me too. But we were both shy people. This took place in the end of August. When the light summer nights started to slowly grow darker and the days shorter. It was a very hot summer though, and all the popular girls would wear white tight tops to show off their flat stomachs. And one day I bought one for myself, just to try to see what it felt like to be a normal teenage girl. I had those silly shoes too, the Spice Girls inspired ones that sprang my ankle during that era. Afterwards, I wondered if the outfit is what started it all. Suddenly, I started getting notes that were placed in the basket of my bicycle. Notes with the messages such as, I like your style, baby, and growing into a woman before my eyes. I didn't tell anyone. I strongly suspected the idiot gang at school. Two of them lived close to me, and I thought they were teasing me for changing my style. Teenage logic. We've all been there, right? To show them I didn't care, I wore my new style all the damn time. One morning I noticed that someone had stepped in the flowers in the flower bed under several of our windows, and I told my dad about it. He worried it was someone checking the place out and planning a break in, and asked me to turn the alarm on whenever I was alone. Things had gone missing before, 
insignificant things, but still, you never know. My dad owned a rather small, successful business, and to celebrate the 10-year mark, he wanted to treat his employees to a weekend away, and I booked a place up north in Karuna. I was used to being left alone at home. Sometimes his work demanded he travel for a week or so, and it wasn't a problem. Again, I was a good kid. And anyways, only a few houses down lived a couple that we knew, and they usually checked in on me if I was alone for more than two days. They had no kids of their own and often helped others. It was on a Saturday that it happened. I arrived home very late on my bicycle after having watched Cutthroat Island at a friend's house. I walked in the front door and noticed a draft. Had I forgotten to close the window before I left? Then I noticed that the alarm was turned off. Had I forgot that too? I walked through the house into the living room. When suddenly, Mr. W, the man down the street, stood in front of me. Hey there, kiddo. Did I scare you? I just came in to check on you. I found this strange since it was well past one that night and he smelled of alcohol. I'm off to bed now, I said, and I got the strangest feeling. Despite it being a hot summer night, I was shaking with cold. Something inside of me told me that this was an extremely dangerous situation. Something about him was off, as if he was wearing a mask, as if someone else was behind his eyes. Not the friendly Mr. W that I knew my entire life. Wine, he said and nodded in the direction of a wine bottle. I shook my head. No. I don't drink, my dad, you know. I said and tried to sound normal, but my voice didn't feel like my own. Oh, you're almost a grown woman now. You can do whatever you wish. He continued pouring wine into an unwashed glass. I've been watching you. You have really grown. He kept telling me how beautiful I had become and how he noticed my new clothes and that I surely knew that was an open invitation to men. I'm a nice person, don't you think? I will be good to you. You can trust me. I will be very gentle. I started it back towards the front door, but he stopped me by grabbing my upper arm and pulling me towards him. Don't be like that. No one likes a tease he says, and when I try to break free, he laughs and goes, Wanna play, huh? I can play. And starts to shake me. I feel how much stronger he is than I, and realize I have to make him let go of me enough to run. At this point, it was as if someone had hijacked my brain, and I started saying and doing things that I wasn't even aware I was doing until afterwards. Yeah, I like to play, I hear myself say, and he smiles and starts to touch my hair. He dragged me off to the bedroom, and I tried to pretend to be into it. I had never had sex, or even truly wanted to have sex, and I had no idea how to fake it, but I tried. The moment he tossed me down on the bed, I said, You must go lock the door and turn on the alarm as I tried to look eager and not scared out of my mind. Okay, he said, don't move. My plan had, however, not turned out as I hoped. He had taken me to my dad's bedroom, not my bedroom. My bedroom had a window that led out onto the roof of the garage, and from there I could have jumped. But this room had no such escape, but it had a phone. My brain had forgotten the number for the police, and the only number I remembered was my dad's work phone. He answered right away. My dad phoned the cops on his other phone, and still had me on the line while Mr. W tried to open the lock with a screwdriver, shouting at me and promising me that he'd gut me like a fish when he got in. My dad phoned another neighbor, Mr. K, who was in the military and often bragged about how he'd treat any burglar to the trip to the emergency room if he was given the chance. Mr. K arrived before the police and he didn't break his promise, but the sounds of fighting outside the room were terrible 
and I had no idea who was on the winning side. Mr. K was an old guy, but he was fit. But what if Mr. W had a weapon? I don't think I dared to breathe until Mr. K asked me if I was okay. And I didn't dare to get out of the room before the police arrived. And even then, I was almost unable to move, as if my mind had escaped my body. A man who I had known since toddlerhood had suddenly started to stalk me and planned to use the fact that my dad was out of town to rape me and God knows what else. I trusted him and I had been so wrong. I still have trust issues today. I spoke to his wife once out long after this incident. She had filed for divorce and told me that the only reason she refused to have children with him was deep down she had feared that they wouldn't be safe in their own house. Mr. W is now dead, and I'm glad we will never meet again.